Next up, we have Dan Michelinso, who's going to tell us about universality in neural networks. Okay. Uh, hi. Yeah, so I want to talk about universality in neural networks, uh, which is a result we obtained uh, earlier this year together with uh, Ronen Eldan and Sil Shram, which was here yesterday. And I'll use the opportunity to tell about some recent uh, developments. And this will be a joint work uh, with Itai Glaser and, and an independent work of uh, Adam um, Klukowski, and I'll tell you about it. Um, so, but what, what is the basic setting I want to consider? Um, so for simplicity, a two-layer neural network at a random initialization. Okay, so basically same setting from before. Um, but here we have a random function it's composed of a sum of independent linear function composed with a non-linear function, that's the activation. So here X is a vector in Rn and the random weights are generated independently as the standard Gaussians. Okay, and then we give random signs and scale by square root of K, which, which makes sense when you want to talk about universality. Right, so each one of those is a random function. You are summing k random functions and normalizing. So standard reasoning says that it should look, this should converge to some Gaussian limit. There should be some center limit here. Oh, yeah, it should be plus or minus one here inside. Thanks. Right. Random signs for each function, otherwise. Just to, to center it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so indeed, this converges to a limit uh, in the space of functions, and, and this was observed by in the 90s by Radford Neil. And according to Neil's CLT, as k goes to infinity, the law of this random function converges to a Gaussian process. Okay, and then here in a Gaussian process is any any random function whose finite dimensional marginals are, are Gauss, jointly Gaussian. Um, all right, so this is Neil's result, and, and since the 90s, there have been many subsequent works generalizing it to different architectures and, and with different metrics, but, but the larger, almost all of those results can be classified into two, two, two sets of results. Either they were asymptotic, so they only said something about the existence of a limit, okay, or they were finite dimensional results. So that if you take some subset of Rn or of the sphere, and you look at the induced m dimensional vector, then this vector converges at some rate to a Gaussian in Rm, okay? And, and, and the question is, can you say something about the convergence, which is independent of a sample? Can you give a rate of convergence for the random function itself? Okay, so, we want to prove a, a non-asymptotic convergence bound in the space of functions. So, so before we can say anything, we, we need to understand how to metrize this convergence. Okay, so a natural metric to introduce on uh, say L2 of the sphere, but it really doesn't have to be on the sphere, are uh, transportation metrics. Okay, so let, let me talk about two of those. So we call this a functional Wasserstein distance. Okay, but basically, if you have two random functions of this on the sphere, you look at the infimum between all of their couplings and you integrate their square difference over the sphere. Okay, so you want to minimize the distance in L2 over the sphere. And you can also look at, so, so this is really the, Wasserstein one distance on L2, okay? And, and you can also look at the stronger metric, which takes the uniform distance. So we're just looking for a coupling which minimizes the maximal devia de um, deviation between the two, the expected maximal deviation between the two random functions. Okay, so we want to prove a rate of convergence with respect to those metrics. And, and, and that's basically what we do for any reasonable activation function. And here reasonable means basically that it's a square integrable with respect to the Gaussian. And, and we saw some, yes. 
Right, two random functions to random elements in L2 of the sphere. The infimum is over all coupling, it's over all measures whose on L2 of the sphere times L2 of the sphere, such that the first marginal is F and the second marginal is F prime. So you. you this is Wasserstein 1 on L2. Yes, um, right, it's, it's. I think this is Wasserstein 2 on L1. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, but, but anyway, it's, it's some way to measure, uh, some metric way to measure a difference between two random functions. Mm -hmm. So we want to, to use the metric, which is induced from the sphere. Yeah, can you say a bit more about, because that, that sounds like, I mean, I can think of other simpler metrics to say the different functions of the sphere. Uh, well, because we can prove it. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I mean, it's it's natural when when you want to think about infinite dimensional regimes, right? Because what I want to say is now, if if we know how to prove convergence under this metric, then I take any finite dimensional sample, I get a bound, a convergence bound, a metric convergence bound, which does not depend on the sample size, right? I mean, I understand it's a very strong metric, but it, I mean, given that you said that there was basically nothing that was proved before, I mean, there's not even like some sort of solid result there, like some like some sort of material duality without doing something. Like you mean, if I would prove it in in this, do I get a duality? No, I'm saying like you know, there's a huge gap between proving like Wasserstein bounds and and what you describe as proof without some kind of mark. Mm -hmm. like, you know, like, Wait, right, right. And uh, but uh, so. So, okay, just like essentially the answer to my question is because you're going to use the Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not that I'm going to use a coupling argument, I'm going to use a metric argument. I'm, I'm going to use the inner, the inner product of the sphere. Uh, I, I, I want to use the metric of the sphere. Uh, and, and once I do that, that, that's the natural, that's the natural notion of distance. Or it's, it's a natural notion of distance. And then you have coupling arguments. Uh, yeah. Uh, this, uh, I mean, distance is between the classes of the functions, right? Not Sorry? This distance is between the classes of function at an primes, right? Yeah, so it's, those, are, those are random elements of L2. I mean, but you have. So you can think about them as continuous functions, for example, and, and that would be fine. The distribution. Yes. You mean distance between distributions? Yes. No, but, but I mean, those distributions are. are no, are equivalent up to measure zero sets, right? So that was what you were asking. So, so you can think about the, like, you can think about as a, a continuous representative for each one of those, and that, that would be the same. Because L2 of the sphere is pretty boring. Okay, so we actually have a separation in our results and we separate between um, activations which are polynomial and for this, we can we, we really obtain results with respect to the stronger metric and activations which are general or non-polynomial, and we only obtain results with respect to the weaker metric. But, but, but you know, we actually know now how to get results for general activations in the stronger metric if you if you do not require the weights to be Gaussian. Okay, and as I said before, what you get, you get a a central limit theorem, a quantitative central limit theorem for you know arbitrary samples which do not depend on the size of the samples. Uh, so yeah, in, in the time I have left, I, I just want to give like to explain the main idea and you know, what else could you do other than what we did. Right, so, so the main challenge in proving this infinite dimensional central limit theorem is that if you would try to use any central limit theorem, you know, the rate of convergence always deteriorates with the dimension. Right, so no, none of them would simply apply in infinite dimensions. And, and there's a very simple observation here which you can make for polynomial functions, for polynomial activations, is that if the activation is polynomial, then every you know, random function you, you had in the sum is a polynomial. 
is the degree p polynomial, whatever. And when you sum degree p polynomials, then your function you, you end up with is still a degree p polynomial. So even though it lives in L2 of the sphere, it is constrained to stay in some finite dimensional space. Uh, and then you can use like existing center limit theorem. Right, so, so the plan is to embed the law of the neural network in a finite dimensional Euclidean space and invoke their central limit theorem results. But, but we do need the embedding to be compatible with the metric. And uh, so, so this works for polynomial activation and for general activation, you can just approximate by polynomials. And, and that's more or less the plan. Right, so so let, let me just illustrate a very, a very simple uh, case, but, but really everything generalizes from this case is that if the function, the activation function is monomial, so it takes t to t to the d or some natural number d. And, and the way to make this compatible with the inner product is just to know that if you, if you apply it to an inner product, right, so you just take the d power of the inner product, this corresponds to linearizing the inner product in the tensor space. So the diff power of an inner product is the inner product between the d tensors power in the tensor space. So the way to embed the network in a finite dimensional space is, right, if this is the activation and we are summing k of those guys, we can rewrite this term just as an inner product in the tensor space, use linearity, and here we have a random vector in some high dimensional but finite with finite dimension Euclidean space and we're just tensoring. Yeah, we're taking its inner product with some tensor power. And this gives a natural definition for a Gaussian process, right? Because now let's define a Gaussian process by just taking any Gaussian vector in the tensor space and heating it with the vector X. So this has a Gaussian law and it defines a Gaussian process over the entire space. Right, and, and with this perspective, if you want to prove bounds with this transportation metric, right, so we want to bound the supremum deviation. So we can decouple the distance from the random vector we had before to the Gaussian vector from the dependence of X. And then just by using Cauchy Schwartz, this is a vector on the sphere. So it has norm one. We just need to understand the distance within a sum of independent random vectors in some high dimensional space and a Gaussian vector. Right, so this is just a central limit theorem now in finite dimensions. Uh, and indeed, you know, so, so you can use off the shelf central limit theorems, uh, but, but actually something we've, we proved before that there are special central limit theorems which uh, take account of the, the special structure of those random vectors. And, and when you put all of those things together, you can prove that when the activation is monomial, then you get something which is a very, you know, very explicit rate of convergence, which is very similar to what you, what you know from finite dimensions, right? So it decreases at the rate, which is proportional to the square root of the number of summons. Okay, and uh, yeah, let me, let me just say about, uh, you know, one thing which appeared in the proof is that we had to bound the covariance of this random vector. For Gaussian vectors, it's just a result of integration by parts. And, and one thing we did now is to generalize those bounds for more general distributions, right? So it doesn't have to be a Gaussian. And, and, let, me, and, and let me just end by saying that that was one way to embed the measure into a finite dimensional space, but there are other ways. You don't need to embed it into a space of monomials. So, so that's the idea of Adam Klukowski, who embedded those uh, networks into a space of harmonic polynomials. And when you embed it into a space of harmonic polynomials, then you don't need to worry about the covariance structure because everything is orthogonal. So he managed to obtain much, much better results also for non-polynomial activations. Uh, I, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can I come back to the question of 
know why. So, you know, if you have this thing, you are interested in, you know, as we talked before, you know, try to do or did is compute the test level and compare it. But so that there is a, a distance that is. The right one, right? So, so, so let me. Yes, yeah, so that's not something I know how to do using those results, definitely. We know how to do it. Right, right. So, you, one thing which I can immediately say is that you can use the same ideas to bound the convergence of the NTK in the space of kernels. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Like it, it should be like I, I believe it should be possible to do it. Uh, and another another thing that I, I thought about, and I, I think that you should be able to do. I, I don't know how to do it. Um, so, so there's a recent result of Peter, which which relies on previous results that you have um, adversarial examples at a random initialization. And, and both these new results, and, but, but for all, already for the older results, there is one constraint which does not allow the size of the network to go to infinity. And, and you know, when the size of the network goes to infinity, then you know it has a limit. So maybe it's enough to prove something for the limit. Right? So that's one thing that you could do. It's, I, I thought it would be easy. It's not as easy as I thought, reasoning about the adversarial examples in, in Gaussian processing. Um, but but I don't know I, I don't know whether it works or not. Um, I mean the idea. Will... Okay. All right. Let's thank Dan again. And we uh, start up at one p.m.